I'm hoping um, that you'll enjoy the presentation today. I just wanted to tell you a tiny bit more about myself, uh, what qualifies me to be giving the talk. Um, <clears throat> I've been a director of the sports psychiatry program in uh, the department um, that basically have been seeing and responsible for the Stanford Varsity Athletes Mental Health Program as it's grown and developed since 1999. So in that capacity, I've seen a lot of student athletes. Most of the people I see are adults, they're over 18. And so I know this is a pediatric and lecture. So I'm going to uh, try to address some of those factors, but please realize that I am basically um, an adult provider. I do have a private practice in Palo Alto and see some high school students there. And then I was the team psychologist for the 49er football team for a number of years. And there I spent a lot of time in um, embedded in the organization and they're, you know, really working with primary care in many ways because uh, the organization is um, responsible for the care of all of the athletes. So just knowing how primary care doctors work in, uh, with the injured athletes. I think the most important thing that I was taught over the years is that it is really impossible to predict who is going to have a psychological problem coming out of their injury. So I wanna say up front, it's not your job to predict or prevent every possible negative psychological outcome. And the goal of this talk is to provide you with some basic information so you can understand how psychological factors influence injury recovery and to help you identify when somebody's having a problem. Another goal is to provide you with information to educate your athlete and their families. A primary thing with that is to reduce the stigma of discussing mental health problems and just to provide information to them about what they can expect. That can be really helpful in heading off problems later on. A third goal of the talk is to introduce you to techniques for structuring conversations and interventions with your clients around the topic of mental health. And I'm gonna go over some language to use when introducing the topic. I'll uh, review strategies for eliciting information and how to encourage self-disclosure, how to uh, build a solid therapeutic relationship with your athlete. And I'm going to go over how to incorporate information from parents and other stakeholders um, and how to address uh, some common parental concerns that come up. Um, there's some important topics I'm not going to cover adequately or maybe at all in this talk. And one is the impact of concussions on mental health and recovery. That topic really merits its own lecture. And I think the other thing that's important to um, recognize when dealing with folks on the topic of mental health is that there's a lot of culturally cultural diversity in terms of <clears throat> you know, mental health stigma, um, how mental health is expressed in various populations. And so I'm just gonna provide basic information, but that could be it's another whole topic. So you wanna educate yourself about uh, like the unique cultural variables of your population. So this slide <clears throat> presents an overview of kind of the basic takeaways for today when you're thinking about the role of psychological factors in injury. And I just wanna set the stage for the rest of the talk with a case example that um, kind of illustrates a lot of these points. And you can, as you listen to the rest of the lecture, you think back to this example in terms of how kind of what you might've done differently with this person if you're seeing them you know, early on in their assessment process for their injury. So uh, we had a client, Frances, and she was a very intelligent high school senior. She was on a competitive women's hockey, so hockey uh, field hockey club team. She was a standout player and had been recruited and accepted to an academically competitive D1 university to play on their team. And about halfway through her final pre-college season, she just began to feel run down and really irritable. And her coaches noticed and they briefly checked in with her, but in her mind, she was thinking, I'm not a quitter, I'm fine. And she really downplayed her distress. So she continued to work through a lot of rigorous, this training schedule and the uh, competitions. And then uh, during the final moments of a game, she slipped and tore her ACL. And uh, during her ACL workup, her doctor actually diagnosed her with mono. And so they treated that and she had surgery to repair the ACL. And then she began, you know, rehab, which took a lot of extra time in her week. 
um, she had, you know, a couple of days a week where extra hours there. And because her coach wanted her, wanted all his injured athletes to attend the games and practice, uh, Francis started to sit on the sidelines and uh, maybe take training video of her teammates, but uh, she really wasn't participating as she used to. And though she was attending practice, she started to feel cut off from her teammates. And uh, she started to feel they were making some insensitive comments to her, not really seeing you know, what she was going through. And she also felt kind of sad and frustrated with her coaches who seemed less attentive now that she wasn't playing. And then one day her coach knows she looked down and asked how she was doing. And Francis began to explain some of her worries. And, but the coach kind of was in a hurry, cut her off and just uh, tried to reassure her by saying, perk up, you're already in college and you're going to be playing again soon. Everything's going to be fine. So she felt she couldn't share her worries and that he wouldn't understand and that she was just being a spoiled baby. So because she was less mobile and she had PT requirements and doctor visits, she began to start skipping social events with her friends outside the team. And then she began to start skipping meals because she thought, wow, I'm less physically active. And she started worrying about gaining weight. She became anxious and had thoughts of, like, I'm damaged goods and I don't have what it takes. I'm not going to make it in college and I've really lost it. So one day during her scheduled doctor's appointment, her doctor noticed she'd lost 10 pounds. At this point, her physician intervened and asked a few open-ended questions about her diet and how she was spending her time and how things were going. And he uh, noticed she seemed sad when she was answering questions. And the physician merely said, hey, you don't seem yourself. You look really sad. And at this point, Francis really began to open up. <clears throat> and uh, she opened up to her physician who normalized her feelings and her experience. And then in consultation with her family, it was decided to refer Francis for counseling. So this is when I came on the scene. She attended individual counseling. And we actually had a support group for injured athletes going at that point. And through that, she was able to connect with other people her age, and she really started to gain a perspective on how her identity was tied to her athletic success. And, you know, we helped her <clears throat> begin to give her teammates the benefit of the doubt that they still cared about her. And she learned some important stress management and communication skills that uh, really ended up helping her when she did go to college. So with her physician and counselor, she was able to calibrate her expectations for recovery and learn strategies to challenge some of the negative thoughts. So this example illustrates the type of stresses that competitive young athletes can face and kind of the typical set of worries and thoughts and also can compensatory behaviors like the dieting that can, that can start. And so um, it's really important that the earlier you identify things, the better, you know, uh, and more quickly, you can get somebody back on track. And so it was really great that her physician was able to notice. So how can you develop a good toolkit of knowledge? The first step is really just being informed. And it basically, you don't need to know a lot about psychological issues or details. We just really want to have some basic information that you can understand when you listen to your athletes, and also that you can begin to share with them. So the first thing is, you know, emotions are normal. <laughs> One thing we notice in our injured athlete support group is uh, a lot of the students were really great about telling you their thoughts and explaining how their, you know, body is feeling, but they really weren't that great about naming emotions and they didn't understand the function of emotions. A lot of us maybe don't. Uh, so, you know, the idea here is emotions are normal. And our emotional reactions are actually providing us important information about a situation. It's actually probably almost impossible not to have a, an emotional reaction to an injury. So the one thing we do know is that injuries are very stressful. They're just inherently stressful and they put a burden on the athlete and their families. Um, likely the stress is greater when an athlete or individual doesn't have the resources to support them. Resources can be external, like good medical care. It's really important to have a good social support system, nutrition, but um, they can also be internal in terms of your mindset, coping strategies you have, uh, confidence, like a feeling of mastery, a self-efficacy sense, and just having other interests outside of the athlete, athletic realm. 
So also on the slide, I just included a list of normal reactions. You know, they really make sense. You know, we feel sad when we lose something. So we're losing, you know, our uh, some function in our body or we're losing being able to play our sport. Um, fear comes when our health or safety is threatened. And so here we go uh, there. Maybe our safety is also just having our friends and social support and having something important that we do that matters to us. Um, you know, anger, because we're, you know, you don't like what's happening. You don't like the way something's going. That's another typical response for people. So as a clinician, you may be able to notice this or pick it up by looking at someone, by asking, but also some of the time you just might start to notice, uh, you know, things like sleep or appetite changes, because these are the kind of things that start in response to the emotional uh, distress. Another thing I just wanna mention here up front is for many of your patients, since they're young, this might be the first major stressful event they have personally experienced. And you know, going through it the first time um, you know, can really just be in itself uh, a real journey. So what is uh, kind of predictable coping responses that everybody goes through? Most people cope with you know, difficult situations or these feelings by trying to get information about what's going on. Um, so providing accurate, helpful information about their injury and what to expect um, uh, in their rehab can, can really start to reassure them. Seeking social support is another major thing that people really need during this time. Social support can come from the physician, the athletic trainers, the coaches, and also just knowing your teammates are still gonna be there, your family's going to be there for you. Um, you know, I think it's really important here just to be able to explain and normalize the process. Um, recognize that it's a time of disruption for the families. Educating your stakeholders, and we're gonna get into that a little bit more, um, can really, really help the student and uh, athlete, young person feel connected and uh, cut problems off at the beginning. So when do problem emotional reactions tend to occur? Um, you know, most folks don't have a severe response to being injured. Um, problems tend to occur when the athlete's expectations for recovery aren't gonna match reality. You know, it's really harder to accept when things don't go well, right? We all are okay when something is better than we expected. But um, when things aren't going well, that's when people begin to look for explanations. Uh, why is this happening? And sometimes that um, becomes a negative self-talk where people attribute the problem to something they're doing or something in their character. Another thing that happens is they start to predict negative outcomes. Um, you know, for example, I had a young swimmer um, and they had to have some shoulder surgery and they were told they'd be out of the pool for a couple of months. And so, you know, it was going OK. They weren't going to practice as regularly here. And they weren't really seeing their friends, but they kept looking forward to going back. And then during the rehab, they had a setback that uh, put her out of the water for another month. And that's frequently when problems start to come up. Um, she started to kind of doubt, like, are my friends forgetting about me? Because a lot of them stopped calling as frequently, you know, they were busy um, and felt, she felt that, um, started attributing that to, you know, that they didn't care about her. And also she started worrying about whether she was going to be in shape for a swimming season. Now, here's another one where the body image and weight started coming in. So to cope, she started work on something she could control, and again, started eating clean. Um, luckily, we didn't really get too far with this one uh, being a problem, but I think here, this just il illustrates where, you know, if something happens that you don't expect, um, often that's when you're gonna have another uh, set of problems arising. Um, here are some red flags just to start to look at. It's a partial list, but, um, <clears throat> You really want to start to notice these are signs that somebody might be having uh, a problematic response. And obviously being upset or having some of these issues like denying the severity of the injury, being really tentative about uh, re-injury so you're not participating in your 
um, rehab as you should, withdrawing, not giving information, all these things are going to slow your recovery down. Uh, I had a cross country runner who sustained a fracture in his foot and um, his rehab indicated a slow return to weight bearing activity. Uh, running was a, such a major component of this person's self-esteem and mood regulation that not to run really started to trigger thoughts of worthlessness and low mood. And he judged himself for feeling low energy and had un helpful, really self-disparaging thoughts like, I can't take the pain, I'm weak. Um, so his doctor started noticing and his AT noticed that his healing, his injury wasn't healing as it should. And it turned out that uh, this young man was uh, not complying with recommendations and was out trying to hike or cross train in ways that were really getting in the way of his recovery. <clears throat> so understanding the issues that occur in someone's recovery timeline is also a helpful way of figuring out what questions to ask and what to assess for in each encounter or visit. Um, you know, in your initial visits, right after the injury, your patient might be a little stunned or in shock. Uh, they're most concerned with getting, getting in to you quickly or hearing about a diagnosis and treatment. And, you know, how they begin to assess their odds of recovery are really important here. Um, if they aren't given enough information, if the visits are, feel rushed, if they don't feel like they're being taken seriously, um, if the diagnosis is kind of complicated, or if who, you know, their provider or whoever's interacting with them seems not to really be invested in their treatment or minimizes their feelings, this when negative appraisals and negative emotional responses can kind of the stage can be set. But here, if the provider seems attentive, skilled, invested in the patient's care, more positive emotions can occur. Um, you know, taking the patient seriously by including their observations and perceptions, their concerns, as opposed to simply providing information is really helpful. It, it gives them social support and, you know, the information obtained is helpful in educating them about these psychological aspects of recovery. So really talking to them about and educating them there about how they feel, what they're thinking is important to how things are going to turn out in the long run. So in your follow-up visits, as your recovery process begins, often that's when concerns about, you know, the future start to spike. Um, the, you know, the athlete's focus starts to shift a bit from assessment of the injury itself to concerns about the length of the time to return to the sport. Um, worries about what others think, coaches, um, how the injury will impact their place in the lineup, um, you know, tend to occur now. And it's also kind of the middle phase where your client may seem to be more emotional or apathetic, kind of almost less invested in their rehab here, especially if the rehab seems like it's going to go on a long time. It's hard to see the end kind of when you're in the middle. So this is where dysfunctional behaviors like missing PT sessions or adjusting their diet can subtly begin. And it's a good time to really do another thorough check-in and just provide information about the importance of communicating with, your, with the rehab team. And then finally, as return to play draws near, anxiety can increase. It's a bit of the horse to the barn syndrome where small signs of improvement or setbacks can have a major emotional response or overreaction and cause prom behaviors or non-compliance with the plan. Um, usually that occurs in two ways. You either get fear kind of being tentative when, when getting out there again and starting to uh, put weight on the injury or get back into it. Um, or rushing back too soon and compromising the recovery. Um, this is where getting a sense on the parents take and also other folks on the in the athlete's network can be really important because they can really be helping the athlete focus on the process versus the outcome, helping the, the athlete learn to check in and how do I check in with my body and trust rehabilitation feedback and just help manage and set reasonable expectations. One thing I'm just gonna kind of uh, note here is athlete concerns might be different than parent or coach's goals and concerns. We're gonna talk about that a little bit more in, the, in a moment. Really, you don't, that's the basic information. Um, and so just now my talk was gonna get more into thinking about assessment and then how to educate your patients and interact with them. You know, the assessment process itself not only functions to identify problems 
and kind of inform your treatment plan and maybe possible referrals, but it's an opportunity to educate your patients, their families, and their support network about what to expect. Just to reduce stigma about mental health issues, normalize emotional reactions, you know, and foresee helpful and unhelpful mindsets. Um, you just want to get everyone on the same page. And I can't say it enough, time and work done at the beginning can save you time and prevent problems and calls, et cetera, later on. So the first thing I wanna mention about assessment process is it's important to identify and get perspectives from all the relevant stakeholders. Athletes are not isolated. They're usually part of a team and a culture and their responses and recovery is public to some extent. So the reactions and agendas of the coaches and their teammates can play a role in how the athlete appraises uh, his or her situation <clears throat> and it can impact issues relating to self-esteem and identity. Threats to loss of self-esteem or position or loss of social support and alienation can cause a lot of stress. And it's important to assess the, these factors and how important that is to the athlete and the family. So figuring out strategies for the athlete to stay connected and stay supported by the social network is uh, really key in recovery. You know, as I'm sure you're aware, if you work with adolescents and kids, uh, the parents' viewpoint and collaboration is essential in understanding um, and develop, you know, understanding the case and developing an effective treatment plan. And this is really even more relevant in the area of mental health and injury recovery, as the athlete's emotional responses can be influenced by their parents. Often, parents have a stake in their child's athletic endeavors. Um, and issues uh, that can come up for high schoolers can be complicated by the college admission process, which is just fraught with anxiety for so many families. So it's helpful here to speak with the patient and the parent separately for part of your visit, your clinic visit, so as to get kind of unfiltered information from each person. And I'm gonna to speak to the topic of parental responses in a few minutes. One thing is I think you really wanna just build in procedures to your clinic visits and start to put together educational materials that you can have to address these issues so that it's consistent from patient to patient. And that will make it easier for you to figure out what's going on and to uh, be supportive. Um, screening, mental health screening and education uh, they really go hand in hand because it's through the screening process that you're number one, just raising awareness about uh, that there may be emotional factors coming into managing a physical recovery. Um, also, you're just noticing that you're taking mental health issues and emotional issues seriously. Uh, saying that, just saying it's part of things normalizes it. And then it's an opportunity to provide facts. Um, Again, with the facts, you don't need to present anything very fancy. It's just letting people know that this is kind of an issue. Uh, so clinic visits with respect to mental health include identifying any mental health issues and red flags that might impact treatment, and also just educating in the patient and the family about what's normal. Um, you want to destigmatize mental health discussions. Um, and another goal is establishing um, a rapport and a collaborative relationship that you can use, you know, as the treatment progresses. So those are the objectives and assessment and strategies for doing it is actually the, the visits, speaking with the client, having follow-ups, knowing what to ask for in the follow-ups. Also using screening measures, and I'm gonna get into that, can be really, a, a, a helpful uh, adjunct to your interviewing or your you know, personal care of the patient. If you can coordinate care, that would be really, really helpful um, with other providers or also maybe with a rehab program. Um, and just providing educational materials, as I said, um, can be really uh, a helpful thing to provide people to give out after the visits. So I wanted to talk about um, assessment visits and screening measures. In terms of uh, good mental health screening and assessment, it, it should include both an in-person conversation and also screening measures. 
The strategies provide overlapping but distinct information, and they're most effective when they're used together. So in terms of the in-person visits, uh, in-person communication really adds the human touch. And it's often through your nonverbal, compassionate, interested interpersonal interaction and demeanor that you can build trust, listen to the, your patient's story, get the vibe from the parent, and pick up on and ask follow-up questions regarding psychological red flags. It's at that point when you're having this dialogue and more conversational um, interactions that you can weave in relevant educational information. And also make sure you know what your athletes and, and parents are actually hearing you say, uh, being able to confirm that they're understanding you. So it's really starting to develop working as a team. And that is just such an important idea that working together um, you know, is the way to go. Um, with respect to the screening measures, they are also really helpful. Um, you know, some patients, some folks will report information on screening measures that they're not going to disclose to you verbally or even in person. And they can provide objective data on how a patient's progressing and also indicate shifts in acuity. Um, they also tend to do this thing kind of tuning. It's like a tuning fork. They tune folks in to their own internal experience. And I recommend using them at every visit. Um, you can introduce the concept of the screening measures at the initial visit and then have the athlete complete them in private. Um, that is key. You don't want the athlete completing them in your uh, where other people in the waiting room can see or in term, you know, in front of their parents. Um, and then at each subsequent visit, when they come in, it's really helpful to have them fill it out before you see them, because then you can take a look at them. The ones I'm gonna show you are very easy just to kind of almost score very quickly and look at. And then you can inquire about what the uh, athlete has written at, uh, during the visit. So how do we introduce the topic of mental health? You're gonna be getting these slides. So I decided I was just gonna do a little introductory script. Um, you know, it's really important to, that you feel comfortable <laughs> Um, and understand your own point of view about mental health issues. So I really recommend you do a self-assessment. You know, what are my beliefs about mental health? How comfortable am I about speaking about these issues? Um, how comfortable am I about hearing folks be emotional or having emotional reactions to problems? Uh, just being in the room with feelings. Um, you know, being able to talk to parents when they're upset. Uh, often it can feel overwhelming. There's a high demand quality sometimes from the parents um, or just, you know, if somebody's really sad, it's often, uh, even for me, and I've been a psychologist for 30 years, um, you know, sometimes there's just this sense of wanting to help or, uh, you know, rush over things or avoid. Um, so being able to be relaxed and uh, matter of fact, you know, not be intimidated, just helps disarm people. And um, just being able to be emotionally available while having good boundaries is the goal. So the boundaries though, are created by having good policies and procedures for yourself, you know, that you've outlined for assessing and screening, monitoring and referring cases if you need to. And having those set up ahead of time is gonna make it a lot easier on you. So um, actually I highly recommend role-playing with a colleague uh, different patient scenarios that you might come up against and how you'd respond. Um, for example, how do I handle an anxious parent, uh, an emotional response from an athlete? What if they won't talk at all? That's my uh, personal favorite, <laughs> one that disturbs me the most if, if somebody's just totally silent. So coming up with ideas there and thinking ahead. Um, one thing you might even think about doing is just setting yourself up with a consultant or a colleague who, who works in this kind of area to help you map the process out. So in talking with your patient, there's what to do slide uh, skills, there's how to do it and kind of what to check in on. So these, these slides, this kind of shows you um, a path to go. Um, and I think it's easier said than done. It makes a lot of sense. The idea is to um, really make it conversational do a lot of listening. Sometimes uh, physicians or clinicians, we're so busy. We have 15 minutes. 
for a visit. Um, and so people kind of tend to rush through. I'm sure all of us, if we've been to a physician's office, sometimes we're on the patient and can feel this, you know, the doctor's in a hurry. Um, I think practice with role play and kind of create this template with these categories in it beforehand. So this slide's really going through the what to do skills in terms of the face-to-face -face interactions with your patient, parents and the patient. And the structure can help a lot in terms of getting good information and managing the visits. Um, like I said, many providers are concerned that open-ended conversations um, will get, get out of control, um, that it'll take a lot of time if you uh, have the patient frame the problem for you. But studies have shown this isn't the case. And usually a patient will complete their impression of their issue in about 90 seconds if you don't interrupt. So if we listen up front, we can easily, more easily address the patient's concerns. Um, another thing you can do there is then plug in information that the patient gave you to you know, flesh out the information and concerns and ask helpful questions. Near the end, you can kind of just make sure you check in on what the client heard. What did you hear me say? If I give you this information, tell me what you hear me saying. And then that's an opportunity to make sure they got the message and give you an opportunity to then clarify or add information. This slide is about just looking at the kind of issues that you want to check in on, and it's a list of ideas. Um, I'm especially going to, you know, just look at these, check in on life problems, other things that are going on with them besides just, you know, what's going on with their physical injury. Um, and when you're asking about them, I think it's really important that maybe you kind of ask twice, right? Oh, well, tell me what's going on with, you know, your family. How's your mother, sister doing? How, how's that going here? Maybe just ask it again in another way a few minutes later. Sometimes if you get a sense that something's going on, asking two questions will open the door. People don't always answer the first time. Taking your time with your client, talking to your client, these are the how skills. Um, you know, the most important thing here, and it says take your time, but it really, when you do look relaxed and your body language, if you can convey, I'm not rushed when you come in the room, it actually gets things done faster because your client can kind of focus on what's going on with them and not be worried, oh my goodness, you know, how, how quickly does this have to go? Or am I going to get my questions answered? It's really important when you're communicating to ask open-ended questions. For example, things like, what emotions have you been having? having? Um, or, you know, how's, are you getting any butterflies in your stomach? Are you feeling kind of low or down or hard to get up uh, in the morning? Tell me what expectations you have uh, about this process. What are your parents or coaches' concerns? What friends have you been seeing? Are you keeping up with your teammates? Is it hard to see them playing without you? What other activities are you involved in? Checking in on sleep, even asking something like, tell me what you ate yesterday instead of, you know, are you eating enough? You don't wanna minimize their concerns. You just wanna let them know that emotions, having emotions is normal. And, you know, like I said before, many of them won't be able to name their emotions. I think it's just important to kind of maybe observe their body language and say, you know, how they seem to be presenting to you. Um, you just don't want to brush off the concept or the topic of emotions. Um, some of them may kind of tentatively put out information. So like I said, just ask a follow-up. If they look anxious or a little sheepish, name their emotions for them. Um, hey, say something like, I'd feel sad or angry if that were me. Or it would make sense to feel sad or angry or even ashamed right now. Do you feel that way? Um, you can offer then kind of alternative points of view and you can start to offer possible coping strategies. Um, uh, and we could, if we have time, I could go over a few of these. Um, just stressing the importance of good sleep, regular eating, the lifestyle management, the idea of controlling what you can control, trusting the process and most important, asking questions if you, uh, encouraging the call and asking questions. I just want to include this slide because it's so important just to take your time and really, you know, 
just let the patient take the lead at the beginning of the visit and make sure you're checking in. This is a, Stanford had many of its faculty, myself included, take a class in um, interacting with our patients. And this was the handout they gave us during our training. And I just wanted to give you uh, ability to take a look at that. I kind of summarized it on the other slides, but uh, it really talks about how to structure that visit. Um, again, I wanted just to come back to the topic of stakeholders' points of view. I think it's really important to understand these various points of view because parents' attitudes can have a major impact on the psychological and physical response of your athlete. Um, you just want to overall encourage parents to take a balanced view. We don't want to rush rehab and risk additional setbacks. We don't want to encourage our, patient, our athlete to avoid because basically problematic responses from parents get into two categories uh, often. It's the impatient parent and the overly cautious parent. And the goal is to bring both of them kind of back to the middle, help them to look at the long range view with respect to their, uh, their child. Um, you know, the impatient parent kind of, when am I gonna get back on the field? When's my child gonna get back in the field? What's going on here? Um, you know, trying to talk to them about how maybe going on that run, you know, you want, what do you want for your child in the long run? Do you want them to be able to be able to go for runs when they're in college? You want them to be able to, you know, go for hikes in their thirties, um, trying, talking to them about that. Then you have the anxious parent who is, you know, constantly making their kid, uh, just, um, concerned about overdoing it. Um, and I think there, you know, that's something I've really seen with Stanford kids that a lot of the parents are so anxious and that makes the child, it's extremely anxious as well. Um, just let them know that, you know, help them. You wanna take their cue from the child and you just, they just wanna encourage their child to an end to their body signals, but not kind of second guess the rehab process. Just taking it slow, but expressing confidence that all's going to work out. I think it's definitely useful to take the time to speak with the parent separately and the athlete se separately. And again, use all those skills from the last set of slides that I presented to hear how the parent feels. That is really going to help you um, save time later. And having the parents know you heard them can also help the parent not be so um, intervening with their child. Um, in terms of follow-up visits, um, they're just a good time if, if things to teach some basic stress and coping skills. And it would be good for you to acquaint yourself with some of these. You just by going to YouTube and typing in some of the categories I reached here in terms of breathing and muscle relaxation and just certain stress relieving skills. Like uh, I really recommend four square breathing. It's very simple. Uh, it could take five minutes to teach, even less. Um, and so uh, I have other skills we can maybe get to if we have a little bit of time. We got started a little late. So, um, and in the follow up visits, again, just remember that process and looking for warning signs, um, worsening and excessive kind of symptoms. Um, yeah, it's just checking in again and re going through just those same processes each time and not rushing the visits. So, I wanted to talk a little about some screening measures here. Um, these are the ones I'm recommending. They're well, um, you know, validated and reliable for kids. Um, there are others. Um, the ones I'm talking about are the PHQ-9. I'm just going to show you slides of those and quickly go through it. The um, uh, G87, and there is a psychological readiness to return to sports scale that's often good. Alternatively, there's a, a measure called the Sport Mental Health Assessment Tool. Um, it's a larger screen. They have first a basic screen. And if you red flag on that, then you go to a more in-depth um, kind of evaluation tool that actually embeds some of the, these tools that I'm mentioning here are kind of embedded in that one. Um, it's not as well validated or normed on um, adolescents or kids. So that's why I'm recommending these uh, few. And like I said, when they first come in, it's really great to give the depression screen, and uh, that's the PHQ-9, and also the anxiety screen. Um, and so on this uh, PHQ-9, basically it's very, you can see it's only uh, nine items. Um, scores of five, 10, 15, and 20 represent different cutoff points 
for mild, moderate, moderately severe and severe depression. Um, and so it's a great tool for just, you know, the person can circle this, you can add it up and just get a quick sense of what's going on. Um, this is an anxiety screen. Again, it's very short. These two can be done in just a few minutes. And here, um, you know, again, scores range from zero to 21. O to four is kind of minimal anxiety, five to nine mild, 10 to 14 moderate, and 15 to 21 severe. Um, as they're coming back to going back to maybe playing, this is a great, uh, again, nice short tool you can use. The patient can fill it out for the visit. And it's a good way to segue to discuss how they feel about going back. Um, and then you can educate them on feeling ready. What would that look like? Um, how do you feel you could say no to your coach? Um, talk about what to look for physically and what symptoms they should be concerned about. And also maybe check in on fight or fight responses. You know, trust your intuition. What's your body say? Um, you know, what happens if I get hurt again? Um, on this one, basically scores, uh, each, each item is, you have to, the person would rate them on a, how confident do I feel on a scale of like zero to hundred. Then you take all the scores and divide by 10. And scores between 50 and 60 suggest that the athlete's ready to go back to their sport. Um, again, just starting to provide resources. I think it's so important just to let your clients know and have clear instructions of how and when to communicate with you. Um, train your staff members on how to identify and respond to mental health concerns. Have a in-service in your office and consider visit phone follow-up and check-ins. Um, nothing feels more comforting than having your physician or the physician assistant, someone in the office, just give a call and check in on how things are going. And you could, depending on what the injury is, figure out a schedule for that. You also want to focus on coordinating your care, making sure you have releases for other providers so you can talk to them if necessary, um, while keeping the client's, you know, confidentiality and just educating everyone in the, what is a good rehab, uh, best practice. I really think getting articles on this and handouts um, in the references section, there's good articles that you can look at and provide to your athletes and their families. Um, and just a good, you know, references to articles so that they can be educated as well. Being able to give somebody a handout can really, really help. And then just quickly coming to the end of our talk, but interacting with other professionals. Um, is something that really helps too, because again, they're in a social milieu. Just knowing, I, I, some of you may have a rehab programs you're affiliated with. Again, just knowing what the best practices are so you know, uh, you can tuck in with your athlete on how that's going. Finding other programs, nutrition programs that understand the athlete mindset and nutritional needs, if you want to refer to that, can be really helpful. Um, and these are just some factors that um, can be really important in a rehab program. You want a rehab program that recognizes psychological factors play a role um, and that they can be on the lookout too uh, for issues. And um, just a graded response to sport and practice can really promote the psychological readiness and thinking about that, helping the athlete maintain contact with their team and coaches during the rehab process as well. So <clears throat> in referring to mental health professionals, you know, the key here is it's just important that the professionals that you refer to have adequate training. And overall, uh, I would go with a licensed clinician who specializes in the age group of your patient over what we call a sports psychologist. There's often a lot of confusion as to what a sports psychologist is, and many unlicensed people will call themselves by that name. Um, so before you choose someone or refer, it's important to understand what the differences are um, you know, there, I mean, the key is a license. Most, even for sports psychologists, like 70% of what you're talking to your uh, athlete about are their personal problems. They aren't necessarily performance exactly related. Um, that said, you know, there's this whole new field that's developed over the last 10 years of specialty in sports psychology, realizing that athletes are, a, you know, a valid subgroup uh, in the population. And those people have um, definite uh, graduate training 
and uh, there's a certification and that you can ask folks to provide you with information about that. Um, but you know, anyone who's practicing psychology in the United States has to have a license. And so making sure there's just these minimum standards that's there to project you. Um, yeah, so that's what I would say to that. I also think it's really important that you develop your own referral network uh, ahead of time and have a list, maybe talk to the people, um, get to know them. Uh, I know sometimes insurance can be a problem there or money, financial things, um, but um, you know, most people on this thing, there's so many of you in different parts of the world, I can't really talk to it directly in terms of location. But I do recommend putting together a list of vetted professionals that you can refer to who you trust. Um, and I think that would help. So just in summary, you know, no one wants to be injured, but really you could look at this as an opportunity. Uh, teach the athlete and their families. It's an opportunity to learn and grow a growth mindset that's non-judgmental and process oriented, um, you know, is just you know, very fact-based and focus on reasonable goals is just a great thing to be able to learn for them, uh, students, kids in the long run. It's gonna give them lifelong skills and just a few simple steps can do a lot of good. And so now if folks have questions, I think Courtney is gonna help me with that. Yeah, thank you for that talk, that was awesome. So we have a couple coming in and feel free to continue to uh, type them into the Q&A section. Uh, so our first question is, how do we continue to improve athletes' trust and confidence when athletes fear re-injuring a limb they don't trust? They'll naturally put more strain on the non-injured limb. Right. So I think one of the most important things, and I'm kind of wondering who that came from. That's probably a coach or athletic trainer. Um, I think it's just re really helping them to learn what are the signs and signals in my body that would tell me that there's a problem and doing kind of a graded introduction to putting the weight back onto say the leg or, or whatever that body part is, um, how they feel validating. A lot of times I think it's just validating their intuition asking the question, how are you seeing this? What's your thought about putting weight on that limb? Tell me what your concerns are. And trying, if, if the concern is kind of unbalanced, right? Or it's like, if I, it's, it's um, kind of extreme or it's predicting the future in a way that's not uh, making sense, then it's really kind of doing a little cognitive restructuring and just, hey, um, what's the worst thing that could happen? What's the best thing that could happen? And now let's talk about what the most likely thing to happen is and try and get them in a more balanced point of view that their body would probably start giving them signals um, that something was wrong and that you're gonna check in with them on that. I think it's actually just talking to them and reassuring and asking what they're thinking about it and then trying to get a balanced point of view. All right. I'm curious to know if you have used neurofeedback as a tool to manage psychopathology related to injury. Um, I haven't, but actually at the 49ers, when I was there, they developed a really um, elaborate system with this. Um, and I think it can be really, really helpful in helping people learn it. It's kind of biofeedback, I think is really what we're talking. That's how I always saw what they were doing. Um, and it really helps people learn to tune into their bodies and to manage their stress better. And I think that's one of the main things that it does. So if you don't have elaborate equipment uh, for that, some of the simple things you can do are just um, teach a little bit of mindful breathing and um, you know, learning how to slow your heart rate down um, by, you know, uh, breathing in for six counts and exhaling for six counts and having them kind of learn how to regulate their body and, and notice that. So you could even do that in your office or on the field or whatever. It's a great thing to help with anxiety management and just knowing about your, how your body works, being able to calm yourself down and focus. All right. 
Um, pushing oneself is normal to develop and succeed in life, especially in sports. How do we recognize when our patients are too many standards of deviation off or too cautious? What's a positive level of pushing? Wow, that's a tough one. <laughs> so many things depend on the situation. I think if somebody is burning out or if they if they're kind of frantic, um, and if their life starts to, I'm, I'm going on the side of doing too much. Um, you know, so many of these athletes are taught very young. You know, we internalize the voices around us when we're younger. And when we start to internalize a voice that's invalidating of our, our emotions and experience, um, I think that's kind of the time where things are getting out of control. So if your athlete is more concerned about, um, you know, they're not having fun, um, you know, everything is about the future. Um, there's a feeling of impending doom and a lot of breakdowns. Sometimes you can really see this if somebody's better in practice than they are when they're competing because the stakes get too high. Um, I, I just think noticing signs of stress and looking for those red flags can really be helpful. Um, and then you get the other side where people, when they're feeling a lot of pressure, want to avoid. Um, I think it's just, you know, um, believing in them and listening to them and, and seeing the bigger picture. You know, what is success? It's not just necessarily scoring that goal, you know, uh, trying to embed them in a bigger picture about what is success in life. It might be really being there with your team. It might be really sometimes learning how to say no to something. Sometimes when we can say no to something, then we really can say yes and put ourselves in more because we are trusting ourselves. So hope I'm not giving too psychological based of answers there because I know you guys are out there dealing with you know multiple people at a time. But I think, again, you can do just a ton with listening to someone, hearing what their experience is and just not imposing your point of view, but you know, figuring out how they can solve some problems for themselves. What's their meaning in life and what's important to them? All right. Do you recommend any specific educational resources, books for the athlete outlying coping skills to deal with or think about injuries? I honestly think the NCAA has a great website and they have a lot of good resources there. And, and, you know, if you just Google that, you come up with a bunch of their handouts, which can be really, really helpful. I think that's the easiest place to go. There's so much on Google now, you know, you can get so many articles. Um, but, you know, it was interesting because I tried to find if there were, you know, if you could give a handout that just kind of explains, like, what are some issues that might come up for you? Um, and they really didn't have anything like that. So I was thinking of writing one up, but I didn't quite get to doing that. So. If I do it, I'll send it out and along to the group. Great. Um, how would we as clinicians manage or address a situation where the stakeholders, primarily parents, are not concerned or denying any mental health concerns that are needing to be addressed in our patients? Right. So here's where there's so many factors that can come into play there. Um, at that point, I really do think it's upfront spending time with the parents and finding out what they do, what their goals and motivations are, right? Trying to find out what's important to that parent. And then there's ways you can kind of interview or reframe uh, the mental health issues as, as being part of helping them get, or helping them and helping their athlete get to whatever the goals are. So for example, you know, if there's a, a kid who's having trouble with their eating, right, or something like this, uh, that's uh, often where a lot of times there's a lot of denial about, you know, weight and shape concerns. Um, but, you know, helping them understand the toll it's taking on the kid's physical body can be a really helpful um, tool there. Also understanding, you know, if the kid has depression symptoms, you don't necessarily have to use that word, but you can just talk about actually the facts. You know, he's, he's, uh, has, he's up all night. That's causing him to have concentration problems. Here's how we need to intervene and intervene about the variables themselves 
as opposed to um, and getting support for those and information about what the actual problem specific problems are that you can look at instead of calling it you know he's depressed or you know there's a mental health concern there all right um we'll do this will probably be our last one um just to be cognizant of everyone's time um, what about things that aren't due to a physical injury? For example, the twisties as experienced by gymnast divers. How do you advise these athletes? I think it's kind of like the yips. Yeah, boy, those are tough. Um, you know, I think a lot of it is, again, and, you know, I'm not a specialist in that. I mean, I've mostly seen that with baseball folks, in the, <laughs> to be honest, uh, and it can be really tough to get out of one of those situations. I think it's, you know, again, all I can say is it's really stepping back, taking it seriously, having confidence in the, in the, in the athlete's abilities, finding out what might be, you know, the extraneous pressures and being realistic about those. Sometimes it's really naming what the other pressures are and validating that um, and not moving so fast to change strategies, you know, because if we, if we get distressed when we're the helpers, that just kind of, it's like, you know, on the, on, on the African plane, when one gazelle gets nervous and starts to run, then all the others do. So I think it's remaining calm, believing in your athlete, taking it one step of it at a time and just letting them know you're going to do what you, everybody's just going to take it in order. And there's a lot of confidence of getting back to normal um, and just providing a lot of support and not looking like it's the end of the world. Right. Because sometimes the people involved in their care can be more invested in the outcome than actually that particular athlete is, he, he is even invested in it. And I think that's when people get into trouble as helpers. Great. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Post, for joining us this morning.